Welcome to all of our ISM members and guests joining us for today's program hosted by ISM New Jersey. Our speaker today is Graham Crawshaw. He is actually one of my favorite speakers. I'm prejudiced, I know. Really oh. enjoy Graham and I love all of his insights and we have so many great speakers, but uh, Graham and I have been doing this for a few years now, so mm -hmm. I really enjoy bringing him on. Uh, today's program, we did this about, I think, a year, year and a half ago. It's the Centers of Excellence, Implementation, Running, and Value. And I know there were a few people that have asked me to repeat this, and that's why Graham's coming on, but I know um, he actually has more updated information. So we definitely want to make sure everybody does participate in the polls today because um, it'll give us a better pulse uh, for your for our audience. So please be sure to participate in all the three polls that we're gonna be running. And also be sure to place any comments or questions that you may have for Graham um, in the chat area. And then after the presentation, he'll do the Q&A. Now on to our speaker. I'm pleased to welcome back Graham Crawshaw, who is the Procurement Content Director for CASME from the UK. Graham has the overall responsibility for the quality of CASMA's global roundtable and virtual events program. I'm sure there's more other things that uh, Graham is doing. And prior to joining CASMA, Graham spent 20 years working in procurement for the music industry with an operational and marketing environment. At EMI, Graham regularly supported major artists, including the Beatles, Queen, and Pink Floyd, in developing and sourcing their unique packaging requirements, and subsequently worked on the company's first music streaming contract. Graham is also a fellow of SIPS, and he is a frequent speaker for ProcureCon, and he was just at uh, ProcureCon Europe, I believe. At this yes. point, I'm going to turn it right over to you, Graham. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Kathy. And it is great to be back. It's uh, it was just uh, the end of uh, before before summer that I was last with you. So, yeah, great to be uh, back. Let me immediately share my screen and then hopefully that will let everyone see the uh, presentation. Yeah, hopefully that's uh, that's worked. Um, let me get straight into it. Delighted to be here. Centres of Excellence, and, and yeah, I hadn't realised I'd done this two years ago, whenever that was. I've definitely got the very latest information on what's going on. As Cathy says, I'm, I'm from um, CASME. We are very much a community, procurement community organisation supporting organisations around the world. And, and I'm responsible for all the procurement content of, of that. But I'm telling you that because... That is the source of the information that I'm going to share. So just some of the CASME members on the screen there, different sectors, different sizes of companies, but most of them have got procurement teams in different parts of the world. And through the benchmarking, through the events, I've got access to a lot of information and that I'm able to, to then sort of bring and part of giving back to procurement. So I think it's a small world, great to give back and uh, really love supporting uh, the New Jersey chapter. Let me stress the last slide about CASME is my favorite because we don't have any sponsors, suppliers or consultants. And that means that everything comes from procurement. So all the information I'm going to share with you has come from hundreds or thousands of category managers around the world contributing to the topic. So that's the that's the, the source of, of everything. I don't make it up. Uh, you'd be pleased to know. And it certainly has not seen any AI anywhere near it. Let's start with what is the center of excellence? And I wanted to put that, and, and there's quite a lot of text, and anyone that knows me knows I just like to talk. The slides are just there to, to help support, and we will share the slides so that you've got that detail. But a center of excellence can mean different things to so many organizations. And in fact, many organizations don't like the word excellence because it, it's putting you on quite a pedestal implying that you're really, really good. And in practice, are we really? What we are, though, is a, a centre, a group of people that are dedicated to support the rest of procurement. That's the way I really do like to look at it. There's wide variety 
across organizations and so want to sort of describe that so even if you don't call in your company it's a center of excellence and let's face it it may be one person is that service provider to procurement so they can be multiple people it can just be a really small function to me it's the principle of having an in a group of people really focused and their stakeholders are the rest of procurement and there are certain activities that we do in procurement where it really does make sense to to centralize and have it done in in that um, in that way um what you actually add into the mix will depend on your maturity of the function the resources that you've got and the specific needs of your your particular team so please don't take it that there is a single structure and that is the center of excellence let's look at it as that function that really provides that support and it then means procurement can be much more efficient consistent so if you're working across multiple countries it definitely makes it much much easier so some of the typical activities we see include sort of data analytics, market intelligence. Now that's one we've seen grown significantly. Have all of your market intelligence centrally sourced and then delivered to category managers based on what their requirements are. So whether you're accessing individual reports, a Dun & Bradstreet type report, or whether it's something specific from a another market intelligence provider that preparation work can be done for you and then given to the uh, the category managers manage, managers now <clears throat> there's some tactical work that some companies choose to centralize within the center of excellence and our experience is that there are some companies that have put that work there almost to start the process of outsourcing so the whole outsourcing of tail spend or just low value, I mean, you know the type of, uh, of work that that involves, that in order to get it fully prepared before outsourcing, let's take it away from the category managers, let's put it in a center of excellence and let them do the establishment of the processes and the work that needs to be done so that then when you do outsource, you're outsourcing something that works and is effective because we know the old adage, you don't outsource a problem, otherwise it's not gonna work. You don't want the third party to be tidying up for you. So there's a lot of logic in saying, yeah, let's put that even though it's tactical into this center of excellence and then consider at a future time whether it's best to, uh, to outsource it. I think this central organization has been measuring the procurement function now for, for some years. So again, that's a very popular activity. Define KPIs, establish them, track them. And especially if you are a global organization, you could pull that data from different parts of the business, different parts of uh, different countries, and put that all together to then effectively see, well, where is procurement operating the most efficiently? The technical side also is a relatively sort of newish one. And it's an ideal situation to either test out tools or where it doesn't make sense to train up individual category managers, then have that done as a center of excellence. I mean, I do know some organizations where e-sourcing if you're not regularly doing e-sourcing and auctions, then you can forget how to do it. Whereas if you put it all to a center of excellence, then it can be a really cost-effective, but more importantly, efficient way. And it also then helps you manage what the category managers are responsible for, for looking after. I promise uh, they're not all text heavy, but I just thought, how else can I get this across? Use this for reference after this presentation rather than try and uh, I'm not going to read it all now because that would be boring for me, let alone for you. But I just wanted to show you we've collected all of this information from procurement and really said, look, this is the list that may be within scope.
I mean, I've already mentioned some of them. So there's a lot of activities that if your function is large, then great, they can do it all. If you're one person, then it's not going to work. So obviously there's there's a whole sort of scale of uh, effectiveness of looking at this um, this scope. But I thought, yeah, useful. Let's just group all of that together and, and then sort of share that uh, that with you. I will call out learning and development as well. I think I've seen, well, I have a trend, certainly since the pandemic, where it makes sense to consolidate learning uh, for the procurement teams into the center of excellence. That helps get consistency. So if you use a an outsourced provider for negotiation skills or contract management skills, then funneling that through the centers of excellence makes a lot, a lot of sense. It also means that you can track and understand the capabilities of the team, who needs to be trained in what, and, and so it becomes much more efficient. And it also ensures that you're raising the standards of your team on a, a consistent basis. And again, if you're global, that is important. You don't want one region taking over another. So actually managing learning and development is, is really useful and helpful to, uh, to consolidate. Cathy, let's start with the first poll. We've got three polls in the, the session um, tonight. Um, so let's start with the, the first one. I've been describing what I'm seeing as a, a center of excellence. And I'm keen to know, is it still very popular to have? Um, or is it something you're considering? So does your organization have a center of excellence? It's a single choice, so not too uh, too difficult. So the answers are either no, and it's not being planned. So maybe you just don't think it's relevant at all. It's in the planning stages, but not implemented. Recently implemented, but still being improved. In place for more than a year and stable. In place for two to three years, and dynamic, so doing well, or in place for, for more than, than five years. So um, I'll just give a few more seconds to, um, it'd be great to see how many of you can uh, can respond. Um, I know the technology doesn't always work, but the results are coming in thick and fast, which is good. Uh, great to have 27, uh, in fact, 28 people on the, uh, the, the, the session today. So great to, uh, to have everyone. And uh, just give it a few more seconds, and then we'll uh, we'll end and share the uh, the results. I think we're probably about there, Kathy. Do you think about half? So let's let's share the results. So interesting. Um, no, and a center of excellence is currently being planned. Is the the response by sixty four percent of you? Now maybe that's why you've come along to this presentation. So if you have, thank you great to join and I'm hoping that the information I share then gives you something to think about to to see well is it relevant is it suitable for your organization or would it just be seen as an overhead or a burden so just with all things if procurement was the same well it'd probably be automated and we'd none of us would have jobs but the fact that it's so different in every organization makes it exciting and the best department you could possibly think of where you would want to work so there are some of you that have got it in place for a for a number of years and i think like anything else it matures as credibility is built up and the the business really accepts the the centralization process that you've got let me share the results of the benchmarking we did across the CASME community. And I guess, bluntly putting it, it's representing a slightly mature uh, situation than what we've got from the uh, poll. But that's why the, the live poll is so valuable. So the highest 35% saying, yeah, they've already got one in place for two to three years, and it's very dynamic and, and established. But as you can see there, it, it's split around. So if you had the perception that every company has a center of excellence, then, then that's not right at all. So again, it's useful to get the data from procurement as to how they 
see what is going on within their organization. So very few companies really have had centers of excellence in place for more than, uh, than five years, uh, which shows, yeah, there's a lot of learning and development still to be done in this. When we did the survey, uh, we really did want to understand why. What are the objectives? Because I've hinted that it's a cost. There's an administrative burden. It's not facing suppliers. It's not facing the business. So it's a, it's a hard one to put a justification together. And so we wanted to understand why would you want to do it? What is the objective of a center of excellence? So 73% responded that really what they were looking for is that centralization of strategy processes to enable continuous improvement to, to actually take place. So seeing as some aspects of procurement do work better when centralized, especially if we're looking at strategy, I'm not a big fan of global contracts because, my goodness, the world's a big place in, in that respect. And when you have a global contract, you find that the company rarely can affect it properly in regions. They've got sub um, sister companies. They've got individual profit and loss responsibilities. It makes it really difficult to have a truly global contract. However, you can have a global strategy. And I think that's where the center of excellence is really helpful. Define that global strategy, but have it adaptable for regional and local implementation so that you're not seen as that sort of ivory tower organization that's then trying to impose something that's developed in North America into Taiwan or um, another country in Asia or even in, in, in Europe. Number two, 60 percent established cross-functional collaboration and consistency. So we've heard this now for quite a number of years, and I think the pandemic started it. A realization that there is value in having a consistent approach, whether it's the same way that you run your categories, whether you interface with suppliers or stakeholders. Consistency is definitely a buzzword. And so having the center of excellence responsible for achieving that consistency is is also a um is a, is a good thing some of the others then drop off in terms of importance so efficient purchasing with consistent processes when i spoke about the tail spend that may be relevant to um to, to that one consistency in terms of compliance to esg uh, de and i and sustainability the debate there is, should it really be treated like that within a sense of excellence, or should it actually be part of the category manager's responsibility? So you're never going to get a single direction um, or clarity on what is best. It comes back to the culture, the locations, the profitability, the approach that you take to procurement. But nevertheless, more than half, people responding were saying actually there is value in having some of that work centralized and and manage to ensure consistency is in place if that's the primary focus let's run the second poll today and find out exactly what you are doing so even if you're not having a center of excellence at the moment let let's see what you're thinking of if you were to to do that so we're looking at the primary function so what are the primary functions of a center of excellence uh, and again you've only can pick one so i really want you to think before just responding to to really understand what is in your organization what would that be most advantageous so just whilst you're responding we've got refining standardizing optimizing centralizing the sourcing process some of the things i've been sharing with you cost savings 
Now, my goodness, we're all under pressure for cost savings. Let's let's make no question of that. And anything that you can do to help cost savings will definitely be appreciated by the organization. Supplier qualification and onboarding. Yeah, may make sense to to centralize um, that. Um, oh, sorry, I should probably make sure I read them off the, the, the same list here. Um, performing. Yeah. Qualification onboarding. Providing strategic consultancy, that is certainly done by some companies. Developing the best practice for ESG, uh, diversity and inclusion, sustainability compliance. Establishing a repository for digital solutions, so very much a database-driven activity. Establishing training, career development, job rotation, or defining protocols for strategic versus tactical procurement activities. So um, give you a bit of time because I know uh, there's quite a bit to, uh, to to focus on on that. Just sort of what do you see are those primary functions of a center of excellence in regard to your organization? So you know the culture, you know your business better than anyone. What would you say if you either have got one or you'd like one or don't have one, but maybe think about having one, what would you see as that primary uh, function? And we have done a single choice because we really wanted you to think about that um, because otherwise you could probably tick all of those. So we wanted to make it so that it was um, a, a very thought, re thoughtful response. I'll just give a few more seconds because I say it was quite a complex one. And then we'll uh, we'll share the results. So I think we're there or thereabouts, uh, Kathy. So let's uh, let's share those results there. So I'm not surprised. Um, I think if I'd done this presentation six months ago, it might have been different. But seeing that sort of okay, the first one is that standardisation. So I think that's almost the the classic justification where you can get your return on investment for the uh, um, center of excellence but cost savings conducting spend cost savings financial um, analytics such is the pressure on procurement at the moment given all that's going on the volatility that we're not seeing go away i think there is such immense pressure that we control that sort of um, aspect of the uh, the business that companies will almost do whatever it takes in order to justify and have the resource to uh, to really focus. So if you've got that analytics, that information, then it makes you much more efficient. You've also got information to then share with stakeholders. A few people just responding to the developing best practices for ESG, DEI, and sustainability compliance, but the others not scored so um yeah interesting to uh, to see that let me therefore share the the casmi results on on that and yeah very very similar it just shows what a small world the procurement world is because most of us all think in the same way so standardization 60 percent um has, has responded in that and then 53 percent really wanting the analytics that information to support you actually doing what you need to uh, to do. I think we've got a slight difference here in terms of performing supplier qualification and onboarding, but often that depends. You need those centralized tools in order for you to do that in a centralized way. So a bit of a, a chicken and egg situation there. And then we go further down the uh, further down the list where there's less interest in uh, in what you might actually look to achieve from the center of excellence i'm often asked about skills uh, and so i thought i'd include this this as a as a chart to uh, to sort of talk about this we have so many different people in procurement we've got those that are excellent at negotiation we've got those that are excellent at supplier relationship management you've got the more traditional people that have perhaps worked their way up um, through procurement that perhaps treat it slightly differently perhaps 
more adversarial or work with suppliers rather than internal stakeholders. We know all these people. And the great thing is you need a mix of people to be successful. But I think in the center of excellence, there's some very specific skills that if you've got those, you're more likely to want to work in a center of excellence and be effective in it. So you'll have those people that if they can't negotiate, if they can't do the, the tough act with the supplier, then they're going to be sort of frustrated and, and not want to be, be working. You've then got those that really do like this. So what we've got here in priority order is that the skills that we're procurement is telling us in the survey that, yeah, this is the type of skill and the traits that individuals have got that they say are perfect for a center of excellence. And I think knowing this then helps you when you are planning who's going to work um, in this uh, in this function. No surprise, relationship management right at the top. And I mean, I think we're going so much towards relationship management that that's no surprise at all because if anything you've got the relationships that you've got to build with your procurement colleagues arguably a quite a tough one to um to, to do especially if there's some friction or nervousness between who actually should be doing the task so if it's something the category managers would prefer to do themselves but they've got to work with a center of excellence team there is, it's, it's never clear cut, can be a bit of frustration there. So relationship management, then we've got the, the other skills that I think are so important. Communication, because the center of excellence is all about communicating. Communicating, dealing with risk, looking at governance. And then the next level, we've got those that are really good at data analytics, uh, the digital skills, again, if you've centralized any of that. But change management is in the middle. And I think if you only look at procurement over the last four or five years, there is so much change management going on that actually someone with that skill set or trait is going to be really helpful because so much of the center of excellence is about getting across that that changes, the changes, the way you want to do things, whether it is centralization, implementing new systems, outsourcing aspects of it. So I think it's really interesting to see the group of skills that are, are required. And what we're saying is, if you've got those, then it's a big tick in the box. You will more likely to be successful when uh, working in a center of excellence. Technology. Let's talk about that. My goodness, this is a minefield, if ever there was one. Um, and separately, we've done work. We know how frustrating it is as you implement new systems. The suppliers will tell you it can do everything. The frustration sets in and the realisation sets in that it's not quite as efficient, quite as full of bells and whistles, if that's a US phrase, apologies if it's not, um, that, that you were hoping that it would be. It's hard work implementing new systems. And so what we've got here is the technology specifically that is being implemented within a center of excellence. So making it easier then for the rest of the function to, to effectively operate. And, and I just thought, well, I'd mention these as systems because we'd had so many people report back. So category managers or people within a center of excellence say, yeah, these are the systems that we're using. It's not a recommendation. I'm completely supply agnostic. I'm really fortunate in the role I play to be completely supply agnostic. Um, but anyway, we know the companies involved, so we can mention them and you can make up your own mind. But when it comes to systems that are effective within a center of excellence, then no surprise, SAP, but also Cooper is, uh, is mentioned. Specifically around contract management, a function that is seen often within a center of excellence. We've got uh, Conga, DocuSign and Icertis. And then in terms of workflow management platforms, 
company service now, especially if you're looking to tail spend, then that whole workforce, work, sorry, workflow system can be uh, something that's really effective for the center of excellence to have in place. I was saying, not recommendations, but I thought, given that everyone's talking about the importance of technology, I'd share the, uh, not recommendations, but the top three systems in each of those categories. So I need a bit of a drink. Talking too much. And with this style of presentation, you're, you're listening. I, I'm doing all the talking. Quick slip of, sip of coffee. As you look at that chart. Um, I thought it'd be really good to get some very up-to-date data as to how are category managers supported by centers of excellence for those companies that have got a COA. Um, and, and it's really interesting here. It starts to be consistent with some of the other things that we've been sort of um, talking about. So analytics is right at the top. Number one, 73%. So making the life of the category manager easier by presenting whether it is analytics in terms of market intelligence or internal information that they put um, put together. Contract database. So again, if you've got a system and, and I'm not going to mention AI, but you know there's a lot of systems like that that are starting to help in terms of contract management, then, yep, yeah, that's coming in at, um, at number two. And then we're looking at lesser uh, consistency across the other areas, which you can see on the on the screen there. And I think that's because the whole gist of this conversation is that the center of excellence can mean different things to different organizations. So, of course, supporting the category manager is also going to be different depending what you've got set up. But you can see there some of the ideas where directly supporting the category manager helps. Our third poll of this evening, uh, this afternoon, sorry, if we can, Cathy, that would be, uh, that would be good. And here you can enter more than one choice. It's not easy having a sense of excellence. So what are the main challenges your organization faces in terms of either establishing justifying that is, or optimizing a center of excellence. And the choices are, I'll read them quickly, lack of clear strategy or vision for the center of excellence. And please, that is a real serious issue. Don't think just because you've got a center of excellence that it's really um, the, the, the answer to everything. If you've not got a clear strategy, it's a nightmare. Limited budget or resources, resistance to change within the organization, difficulty in integrating systems and tools, lack of experience within procurement, challenging in centralizing data and analytical functions, maintaining alignment with ESG, sustainability, diversity goals, difficulty of ensuring effective communication and supplier engagement, and then finally, managing global and regional variations in procurement. If you're all over the place, if you haven't got any type of consistency in procurement and you're operating globally, then maybe center of excellence isn't where you start. You've got other priorities to work, to work on. So I know there's quite a lot there. You can answer as many as you'd like that you think are relevant to, uh, to your organization. So um, just give you a few more seconds there. And we'll take a look at um, at that. But yeah, it's it's not easy, and um, and that's probably why, whether it's the Kashmir results or the poll results, it's it's not a a definite. Yes, we need a center of excellence. So I'm hoping sharing all this gives you plenty to think about, and then hopefully assess whether actually it does make sense to support, or whether you're better off as you are without anything being centralized. Just give it five more seconds. I'm going to have another sip of coffee. And then we'll um, we'll look at the results. So, um, yeah, thank you, Cathy. Let's um, share that. So interesting, limited budget or resources is the longest line. Of course, the percentages don't work because you've answered more than one. 
uh, lack of clear strategy, which I hinted at, and then resistance to uh, to change. So a really, I mean, it's great results, this, because I think it's demonstrating life's tough. It's not easy. It's not an obvious, oh, yeah, we're a procurement organization. Let's get a center of excellence. There's a lot to weigh up and consider as to whether it is right for your organization. And no one can tell you that. OK, you could probably bring in some consultants and I'm sure they're bound to say, yes, it would be a good idea. But you need to assess what what's right for, for your organization, not only whether you do it, but the scope of what's actually included within a center of excellence. OK, um, yeah, stop sharing that. I think we've got the, uh, the, the gist of that. KPIs. We all love KPIs, don't we? Not really, but it's a necessary thing that we've got to do. So, oh, uh, let me just tell you a story. The, the, I had this conversation with uh, a couple of organizations that were trying to do cost savings and report cost savings. And there was an argument because some people in the organization were saying, well, we've achieved that cost saving through our negotiation work. Others were saying, well, we actually know because we'd invested in an e-auction, we have achieved the saving because of the e-auction. And same here. If you put a center of excellence, then what cost saving have you achieved through that? And it's a nightmare and really ends up credibility issues with stakeholder. If you try to carve up the cost saving that's been achieved, essentially, procurement has achieved it through the investment in its systems, in its people, whatever you've done. Um, so don't really try and say, look, we've put a center of excellence. What really have we achieved in terms of a, a dollar amount. 67% saying the integration and standardization of policies and procedures is something that they track and, and really has improved because of a center of excellence. 40% compliance improvements. 40% standardization of risk. Let's face it, that's getting even more important. Then we've got a recognition. A third saying, yeah, cost savings are achieved because of the efforts of the, the center of, of, of excellence. Um, the rest become smaller. So let's not worry about um, about those. But uh, yeah, definitely you've got to track what you're doing, but don't get hung up on trying to allocate cost savings into all those different compartments within an organization. If you're not already in a center of excellence well how do you do it so again not my ideas but when we asked our members what do you actually do to set up and develop a center of excellence there were some sort of common themes that i thought i would share with you today so establish a small group then expand as you progress okay it did not need me to tell you that is a logical thing to do. It didn't need any consultants to tell you that either. But I think the message is there's nothing wrong with starting as a pilot scheme and then building on that scope. It probably makes it more manageable. There are many companies that the center of excellence is one or two people. So there are going to be limits as to what they can achieve. So nothing wrong, often better to start small rather than a big bang approach of, of trying to set up a large team from, uh, from, from day one. Then I'm afraid it's down to the technology. So it's gonna be aligned to how mature, how established you are with, uh, with systems because you need the ability to track and implement some standardization of systems and processes um, if that's uh, if that's one of the objectives that you've got, I'm afraid I did slip in AI here because I think it's coming. It's not here yet, but that's a subject for another presentation next month. But you should start to perhaps recognise the the benefit or at least assess the potential value of of AI. As far as communication goes, we know we're not great at telling the business that we've done a fantastic job. But there's an element that the center of excellence can really help gain credibility. And 
so often now it's not about presenting that dollar amount saving, but actually presenting a bit of a case study of the work that's been done with the category managers, the center of excellence, and sort of demonstrate to the business that, yeah, this is what you've achieved. Make a bit of a story about it. But also, maybe it makes sense to have a standard survey in terms of, um, uh, of, of user feedback. And that can be as straightforward as just a very simple survey, ideally with just as fewer questions as you possibly can get away with. But people then feel comfortable at providing that, uh, that response to you. If you've set up, you've got it established, you've got to then demonstrate value. Um, and I've just realized I've said that first point and I got carried away. Showcasing what you've achieved definitely is something that's got to be done. Say so avoid the dollar, um, uh, do dollar savings focus if you can. I think the onboarding, once you've got a center of excellence established, anyone new into procurement, doesn't have to go through that change management process. They are more likely to be very much accepting the role, the responsibilities, and the input from the people in the center of excellence. So it definitely makes sense, get that into the, the onboarding for anyone new into uh, the, the procurement fit function. And stakeholder engagement, well, that's a pretty obvious one. Everything that we do, we need to ensure is aligned to what the business goals are. So that's got to be the category management team as well as the center of excellence team. So definitely demonstrating value. A link to that, my last slide for today is, is a reminder of the value beyond savings. We do this survey on a very regular basis at CASME. And it is one of my favorites because it confirms why procurement is the best function to work in. No other function gets us so involved across the organization in so many different projects. And this is the value. So of course, cost savings, you've got to do that. We know that, so let's not talk about it too much. But the value beyond savings for the first time, risk management has gone straight in at number one. So it's really interesting to think there, the organization recognizing what we can do in terms of risk. It's about getting that continuity of supply, the, the robustness around contracts, innovation from suppliers, tracking suppliers, ESG, DE&I, sustainability compliance. There is so much activity that no wonder we haven't got any time to get everything done. But isn't that so rewarding to actually see what we can achieve and are achieving for the organization? So I really wanted to end with, um, with that. I'm going to stop sharing. I've been talking plenty uh, today, but I always like to have time for uh, Q and A and to to get feedback from uh, from ev everyone. So, oh, you oh come on with your camera. We want to see you, Kathy. You don't want to just see me. I'm trying. Um, I'm trying. <laughs> oh, you you struggling? There we there. go. There we go. Yes. We go. Yeah. You look like you're in mission control there. So that's I am looking, uh, looking good. <laughs> um, yeah. That I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask for your comment first, if I may, Kathy, because I wanted to present what what we and what I am seeing in terms of center of excellence. Um, any, any thoughts? Well, I do have a question for you. What do you feel? Um, how do you feel the center of excellence will be? What are their trends evolving over the next five or 10 years? I think it's actually going to grow. First of all, very much get the sense that there are certain things that make sense to centralize. And then, I mean, you're talking five, 10, 10 years time. My goodness, what will what will we be doing differently in, in that period of time? But I think in terms of taking advantage of the technology changes, it's easier if there's a level of centralization. So not centralizing everything. And that's why I wanted to separate out the, the strategy from the execution. But definitely in terms of really getting on board that technology 
um, and it will include AI. And let's face it, we don't know what that will look like even in two years' time, let alone five or ten. When we see the change that we've been through over the last sort of two, three years, it's inevitable that that's going to be sort of multiple times quicker. I was tuning in to a conference this morning, and I'm not even going to mention which one it was, but you know, Kathy, they were talking about 10x. Um, and I thought, yeah, OK, that makes sense in terms of the rate of progression and change within the procurement function. So I do think that having a center of excellence is going, going to help. It ties in then nicely with my view of procurement. And we've got all sorts of issues with the name, but we are the relationship management function. And I think over the next three, five, certainly 10 years, we're all going to be about relationships. The great thing about that is a computer can't cope. The computer cannot manage relationships. It can't manage the relationships with your internal stakeholders. It certainly can't manage relationship with suppliers. However clever, it can process transactions. You can outsource. But ultimately, we in procurement are going to be those group of people that can really manage the relationships. The good thing is, if you can embrace the tools, embrace AI, you're going to be the person with the job. So that's, I think, fundamentally where procurement will be going. A lot of outsourcing, a lot of technology, and that sense of excellence will definitely help as we move into a relationship management uh, function. But who knows what we're going to be called, but we'll worry about that in the uh, the future. But in terms of what you will be doing... You'll just be spending your time managing relationships, which actually is what procurement wants to do today. But we can't because we're caught up in all the, the tenders, the RFPs, and let's face it, all the admin that we all have to do, despite the fact we've invested all this money in tools and systems. Definitely, definitely. We do have a question in. Uh, how yes. would you describe an effective governance operation? My goodness, that's from Peter, isn't it? My goodness, what it a is. question at this time <laughs> of uh, of the day. An effective governance operation. My immediate thought comes in is one of, of, of a consistent process. So the way that you work with your suppliers, regardless of where it is, assuming that you've got multiple sites, whether it's in just in North America or whether it's global, the governance needs to be done in a very consistent way so that you can then sort of track back to see the rationale for, for decisions as, as they've been made. Um, that's a difficult one. I'm, I'm struggling. Um, I don't know, Peter, whether you could put in the chat and what your thoughts would, would be. Um, maybe my brain hasn't totally tuned into it. But to me, governance is knowing the processes and policies that you really do want implemented and making sure everyone keeps to them, whether it is ethics, whether it's the supplier code of conduct, whether it's what you expect in terms of reporting on scope three emissions or sustainability from, uh, from suppliers. Um, so consistency, which is actually why the center of excellence could really help. I hope that helps. I, I I'd need more time. I probably could come up with a better answer with a bit more time. But you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. If anybody yeah. has a question, just, you know, put it into the chat. Um, the polls see. were really interesting, Kathy. I, I really thought that, um, yeah, interesting how many people have not got a sense of excellence. So delighted they've come along. Mm -hmm. And I hope you've learned something from that, uh, from the, uh, the information that, that I've shared great to get you get you thinking but i think that point aside there was consistency with the work that that we'd done previously over the last few months and and what we got as a live uh, a live response today so um yeah i thought that was uh, very encouraging that yeah it's it's a certainly something to consider but it's investment it's it needs to be done for the right reasons and, um, and and therefore you've got to really work out what's your return on investment? What does that business case got to have included within it to make it justifiable 
to uh, to have such a, a resource in the uh, in the business and you know what you may conclude you don't need it you may be doing enough of all the other activities and that may be done by your team or people that do category management there's no one size fits all there's no single right or wrong but i would say for larger organizations there is definitely a trend that the center of excellence is is growing becoming more significant but also regionally or geographically diverse. You don't need this center of excellence to be in the center. Sorry, I probably should have made that point 50 minutes ago. They can be anywhere with all the remote working. You may have a really good expert on e-auctions based in Germany. So the center of excellence, can that aspect can be managed from Germany. So it's it really does, there's so many different options there to um, to, to make it work depending what suits your organization. We got something else in. <laughs> we use it as, oh, oh, this is from Peter. We use oh, it Peter. as an integration between senior management, uh, supplies, customers, and staff. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. No, that makes, uh, that makes sense. That makes perfect uh, sense. It's bringing the stakeholders together to get a bit of consistency. And I think that I've used the word consistency a lot, but I think consistency and relationships are all synonymous with the uh, the work of a, a center of excellence yeah definitely definitely well graham thank you again uh any last closing remarks before we end today well i guess i've hinted at it but we've got the next session haven't we and I yeah why don't we tell when... them about that yeah well i can't remember the date because i never could november remember 14th date. november oh, 14th november the 14th excellent and I'll be sharing some of the latest thinking that we've got around artificial intelligence in procurement. So, you know, from my presentation, I'm supplier agnostic. There's a lot of hype involved with AI. And I'm going to be sharing the practicalities. What is procurement actually doing? So really looking forward to sharing that. I'll devise some polls to make sure we also make it interactive. So looking forward to... Um, uh, sending that out. Cassie will be managing uh, that and look forward to that uh, that discussion. Um, as always, always love connecting on, on LinkedIn and, and chatting with people on, on LinkedIn. So please do uh, uh, do connect if we're not already connected. But great to be here, Cathy, and thanks for the invite. Thank you. And everybody, I'll be sharing the recording a little later today. And I will be sharing, Graham, your LinkedIn uh, so everybody can connect with you as well. And I want to thank everybody in our audience for participating in our polls, for joining us today. And to you, Graham, for uh, this uh, another fantastic presentation. Hope everybody learned something today. And hopefully, maybe you might be uh, developing a center of excellence or uh, continuing on what you're doing already. Brilliant. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. Okay. Thank you so much.